Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing, my excellent friends? Okay, it is an, it's been an exciting morning. Most of you probably don't even know about all the excitement, okay? But we're doing good? Okay, good, awesome, okay. Here's the real question I have for you, okay? Are you ready? They don't know how to answer that. No, no, no one answered. Okay, are you ready? Okay. Are you sure? Okay, good. Okay. I'm asking that question here this morning because we are starting a new book in our study of the Word of God here on Sunday mornings. Uh, and if you don't know, if you haven't been here the whole time, which probably most of you actually haven't, uh, we have been making our way through the entirety of Scripture book by book for several years now. We actually started in 2001. If you can believe that, Dr. J. 2001 is when we started. So most of you probably have not been here the whole time. Uh, and this morning in that study, we have come to the book of Galatians. And I feel the need to ask if you're ready here this morning, uh, because while Galatians isn't a very long book, it is packed full of some real gems from the Apostle Paul. Okay. But more so than that, what we see the Apostle Paul doing in this book, in this letter that he's written, uh, is something that, honestly, church people and Christians in general tend not to like very much. As we dive into this book, we are going to see him reprimanding, rebuking, and taking on false teachers head on. And at times, he is not very gentle. At times, he is quite blunt, as the Apostle Paul can be sometimes. And I know from experience having lived in the church my entire life as a pastor's kid, that when the pastor does that, when the pastor gets blunt, church people don't like it. When the pastor, out of concern for his flock, starts to get a little more direct than they think he should, people get upset. In fact, a lot of the times, they will accuse the pastor of not behaving in a, a Christ-like or a biblical manner. They, they get so distracted by how the pastor is delivering his message that they miss the message, all from a preconceived idea of how the pastor has to address these things. They might even leave the church over it. But yet, as we come to the book of Galatians here this morning, we find an entire book of Scripture where Paul is being what most people would call harsh. And he's being harsh to help and save those that he cares about from falling to the teaching of false Christian. Ooh. Just me using that term false Christians made you a little uncomfortable, didn't it? So as we dive into this book, even though it is filled with some absolute theological treasures and truths, I feel the need to give a warning to some, if not all of us, that Paul's approach in this letter is going to make us a little uncomfortable. He pulls very few punches and is very upfront with how he feels. In fact, Paul is so blunt in this letter that many churches would most likely avoid most of it. Or at the very least, they would ignore how harsh Paul is being. Because it's going to make people uncomfortable. But God has given us his word the way he did for a reason. So even if Paul is being you know, mean in this letter, uh, even if that makes us uncomfortable, God has given us this text in his word because we are clearly meant to see that there is most definitely a time for gentleness. But there is also a time for brutal honesty. And here at Cornerstone, we do not shy away from texts that make us uncomfortable. We don't shy away from controversy. In fact, we don't even wade in. We don't, like, tip, dip our toe in first. We dive in head first. So let's do that this morning, okay? Now that I've warned you that the water might be a little colder than you thought it would be, let's dive in, okay? And please, as we do, do not let the message that God is giving us here through the book of Galatians get lost in how the pastor or the apostle, in this case, should handle addressing concerns that they have. Let the word of God guide you. Okay, and since I said that we 
don't shy away from controversy. I feel the need to address this here this morning. Uh, people in the back, don't freak out. This is something not in the script, okay? And I'll be, I'll be brief here, okay? Uh, because in our country a while ago, a, a law that many of us felt was unjust was overturned by the Supreme Court. They Roe v. Wade, okay? And in response to that, a lot of states had laws waiting to make abortion illegal. Okay? One of them was Arizona. Okay? However, what we just had happen in Arizona this past week was the state legislator, actually the House of Arizona, passed a resolution to overturn the 1864 law in their statutes that made abortion illegal in every respect. Made it, made it legal. The, the law made it illegal. They have now made it legal again. Okay? Worse than that, this past week, they had two votes that failed to do that. And then they finally had a third vote that passed it. What that means, everybody, is that there were pro-life legislators who switched sides to make abortion legal in the state of Arizona. That should be a giant wake-up call to all of us. Okay? It is not just about us electing good people into office because you don't know what they're going to do once they get there. It is about us going out into the culture and changing the culture so that they have no choice but to vote for what the Word of God tells them to. It comes to us. Okay, have I been blunt enough? Okay, are you ready? Let's dive into Galatians, shall we? Okay, let's take the leap. We are going to be in the book of Galatians this morning, chapter 1, starting at verse 1. It says there, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men, nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia. So the tension is thick, even here in these first few verses. Okay? But that might not be the obvious thing that you can see, so let's talk about the obvious things first, because even the obvious things are interesting. Okay? This book is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to... Okay, the church is in Galatia. Very good. That was your pop quiz. You passed with flying colors. Okay? And right there is actually an interesting note. This is not a letter directed to a certain individual, like we see Paul do with, with Titus or Timothy. Uh, this is not a letter written to a specific church in a specific city, like we see with the letters to the Corinthians. Okay? This is a letter written to all of the churches in the area of Galatia. Galatia is a Roman province. It's an area of, of the world. Okay? It's a, what we call modern-day Turkey is, is part of that. Okay? And Paul had visited certain cities in that region of Galatia during his missionary journeys. In fact, he'll explain a little later in this letter that it wasn't even his intention to visit the people of Galatia. But a sickness actually prevented him from making the voyage that he intended to, so that he ended up having to stay with the Galatians while they took care of him and helped him recover from his sickness. And while he was there recovering, he recognized the circumstances God had given him as an opportunity. An opportunity to minister to the people of that region. And he won several people over to Christ, resulting in Christian churches emerging in that region, the region he didn't even intend to visit. And I think it's important for us to stop there and just acknowledge that this is an important lesson for us to learn. Back when we, we dealt with the book of 2 Corinthians, we, we saw Paul talking about the thorn in his flesh. Okay? And we learned when we saw him talking about that, that both in Paul's life and in ours, we should view those thorns, those, those things that make life harder, more difficult, not as torment, not as God torturing us because he's mean, but as opportunities. And here again, we see in the life of Paul, we see him being given a thorn, a sickness, an illness that prevented him from going about his journey the way he'd planned. Okay? And I'm sure he was not happy about it. Okay? I have a feeling that, like me, the Apostle Paul was a plan maker. And I'm sure that when his plans were upset by this illness, that he was not thrilled about it. But thank God for Paul's example here. And that even though this illness prevented him from continuing his journey, 
and it was a big pain in the butt, he recognized it not as a big pain in the butt, but rather as an opportunity to win others, others he hadn't even intended to visit, to Christ. We need to learn from Paul here. Things may not go the way you intended or the way you wanted them to. But look for the opportunities that God is giving you even in those moments of frustration. Thorns are not torment. They are opportunities. And this opportunity was given to Paul, and he recognized it as such, and it led to an entire group of Christians arising in the area of Galatia. Think what you could do with your opportunities. But there is a problem. And the problem will become more evident as we continue reading through Paul's letter here. But since Paul left, there are others who have come among the Galatians and are preaching a message that contradicts the message that Paul gave to them. These people are known as the Judaizers. And while they believe that Jesus was the Son of God and that he died and he rose again, they also believed that all the requirements of the Jewish law must still be upheld by all converts to Christianity. So things like the dietary laws, circumcision, must be practiced by any Gentile who comes to Christ. And they didn't like Paul very much because he was teaching a very different thing. So they tried to undermine Paul. They said that he wasn't a true apostle because he wasn't among those who were sent out by Jesus before he ascended into heaven. And so they said, even if Paul has truly converted to Christianity, and let me tell you, we have some serious doubts about that because, I mean, think about what Paul was doing before he said he converted to Christianity to the Christian church. Okay? But even if he did, he hadn't been called by Jesus or by the authority of any of the apostles to do any of the missionary work that he's doing. So therefore, any message that he preaches is not a true one. And I hope now that you, you have that background information, I hope now you can see the tension even in just these first few, few verses. Okay? Paul makes it a point to say that he is an apostle. That he was not called by any men or any man, but rather by Jesus Christ himself when he had a vision on the road to Damascus. But like I said, we are jumping right into the deep end of the pool. And the water is a bit colder than we thought it would be. And it's important that we don't miss this. Because we read those, those first few verses here, and we see where Paul declares himself to be an apostle called by God. And we just kind of glance over it. Because thousands of years of church history has taught us that that's a fact. And it is. But we miss the fact that Paul is directly addressing his critics by making a point of calling himself the things that he does. Right at the beginning of this letter. He is saying, I know what those people who are amongst you say about me. And I want you to know that they are categorically and factually wrong. He is not pulling punches. He is getting right to the heart of the matter just in the first three words of this letter. It is a direct refutation of the false teachers in Galatia. Okay, and he continues. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sin to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I love this part. And I love this part because even in this letter, where we're going to see Paul forego all the usual fluff that he usually puts at the beginning of letters to kind of butter people up, okay, he's going to forego all that. Okay? But even in this letter where he, he doesn't do any of that, he cannot help but break into spontaneous praise when he thinks about the amazing gift that Jesus' sacrifice truly is. He can't help but praise God for what God did. But I also love this part because what we see here is what, what most people call Paul's typical greeting that opens up almost all of his letters. Okay? But we believe that Galatians is one of, if not the, first letters that Paul wrote. So while it is the typical greeting that we see Paul do in, in his letters, 
I think actually what we see here is the formulation of that greeting. And I think there are good reasons why Paul is greeting, particularly the Galatians, in this way. And why he continued to greet others that way as he continued writing letters. And I will explain that, but let me explain that after we read a little bit more, okay? So it says in verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which really is no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert, to pervert the gospel of Christ. Okay, and here we get to the heart of the matter. The reason that Paul is writing this letter to the Galatians. He says very bluntly, I am surprised that you all are so fickle. That you have all so quickly deserted me and the gospel that I presented to you, a gospel built on the grace of Jesus Christ, and are turning to another gospel, a gospel which Paul says is not a real gospel at all. Okay, remember, the word gospel means uh, good news. He says, I'm surprised you have turned away so quickly from the good news that I brought and have turned to this other thing that those pushing it claim is good news, but is actually far from it. See, what we need to grasp as we look at this is what the Judaizers were doing. They were saying, yes, it is great that you believe in Jesus, that he died and rose again. Perfect. But all those regulations in the Old Testament, they're still binding on you. You still need to do those. You still have to keep the whole law of Moses or else you're not really saved. And what Paul is pointing out is that by doing that, by saying that, by preaching that, they have completely cheapened what Christ did. If what the Judaizers were saying was true, that you need to believe in Jesus but also keep the entire law of Moses, then what was the purpose of Jesus dying on the cross? What was the point of it? Paul is pointing out that, that Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. He said that very thing. And while there may be some parts of the law that are still binding upon us because they're based on God's character and his character, which don't change, so therefore the law doesn't change, there are other parts of the Old Testament law that were meant to be there for a time until Jesus came to be the final sacrifice that was necessary to fulfill that law completely. In fact, all those laws that were meant to be there that way were meant to point to Jesus and his sacrifice. And once that sacrifice has been made, we are no longer to, required to continue as if it hasn't. If the Judaizers are correct and we are still bound by that part of the law, then Jesus' sacrifice means nothing. The grace that he extended to us by fulfilling those requirements once and for all has been rendered useless. Okay, it breaks down like this. If the grace given to us, okay, the grace given to us by Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross is sufficient, if it has truly fulfilled for all eternity, the requirements of the sacrificial and ceremonial law, then we can have peace in knowing that we are no longer bound to keep that law anymore. Not because it's obsolete, but because it's already been done. Okay, it's like if you're in a restaurant, okay, and you're sitting there and you're waiting for your bill to come, and it never comes, and you go to your waiter and say, we need our bill, sir, or else we can't leave. Okay, and he said, oh, the people over at that table already paid for your bill. It would be silly for you to then insist on paying it again. Okay, same thing here. We continue to keep the universal law, okay, the law that's built on God's character. We call that the moral law, not out of some misguided attempt to make ourselves holy enough to warrant God's favor, but instead out of acknowledgement and peace, because God has already shown us favor and grace through his son. But if what the Judaizers are saying is true, that the grace given to, G given to us by Jesus on the cross has not changed a thing, and we're still bound to keep the entire law of Moses, 
before we can be saved, then we are all doomed. God has not given us any way, any grace through Jesus, and we cannot therefore know any peace whatsoever. Because we are all stuck in a constant, unwinnable battle. We are stuck in this quest to become justified through our own actions and righteousness. A quest that all of history has told us is an unattainable thing. The good news that they claim to have given the Galatians is nothing more than a death sentence, completely lacking any sense of grace or peace whatsoever. So I think that Paul purposefully addresses the Galatians this way, grace and peace, because it speaks directly to the conflict at hand in Galatia. But then it became his usual greeting to all the brothers and sisters that he wrote to because he didn't want them to lose sight of it. He realized that the grace and the peace given to us through Jesus Christ is at the very crux of the matter. It's at the crux of everything. If we understand it, it changes everything. So when he wrote a letter of encouragement or of instruction, he felt the need to include it right there up front to set the stage for everything that followed. Like I said, some theological gems here. And just very quickly, because I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I do feel the need to point it out, I do feel the need to point out how shocked Paul is that the Galatians have turned so quickly. Okay, and I can echo this statement. I have seen in my own life in the church this exact thing happen. False teachers come in amongst us, get in people's ears, take them out to lunch and talk to them. And it is like a light switch has been flipped. Those people who have held to sound doctrine for years, for decades even, all of a sudden abandon it completely. And it can be quite shocking to an apostle or a pastor. Okay, also note here how insidious and subtle the false teaching is that Paul is addressing. This is not some massive departure from God's word. In fact, the Judaizers would probably claim that they actually have more respect for God's word than Paul does. They're not pointing to some other savior, some other figure. They aren't discrediting Jesus or saying that you, you need to follow somebody else. They're simply saying, yes, accept Jesus as your savior. And dot, dot, dot. And most times, that is how subtle false teaching can be. Okay. I know that the youth uh, have started watching sermons from other, other pastors, and they're, they're analyzing the sermon to see if they are biblically sound or not. Okay. First off, before I move on, I just want to say that that is awesome. And we should be encouraging our young people to be actively engaging with their faith in ways like that. In fact, all of us should be striving to be like them. I know it's really easy as life goes on to just kind of put things in cruise control, particularly your relationship with God. But that is something that we need to fight to ne ne never let happen. What's that? You can send people the videos. If you want the videos that they're watching, Pete says he can send you the videos. Okay? So major, major props to the Utes here. But I know from talking with Pete that they have asked him to give them a really bad one to watch. Because the ones that they've watched weren't horrible, but they also weren't, you know, raving lunacy either. Okay? And, and there's the rub. Because more often than not, that's how false teaching works. It's how it works its way into our midst. Because unless you examine it closely, it seems perfectly fine. The crazy, wacky false teachers, are, they're the easy ones to spot. It's the subtle ones that are far more dangerous. It's the ones who say, yes, Jesus, and those are the ones we need to be overly watchful for. And Paul continues on. Now, hold on to your seats, because if you thought Paul was being blunt already, you ain't seen nothing yet. Verse 8 says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. I actually like the translation we used when, when Cindy read it. said, let them be eternally cursed. Verse 9 says, as we have already said, so I now say again, 
if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be eternally cursed. Let them be under God's curse. Whoa. I told you he wasn't going to pull any punches. Paul says a terribly controversial thing here. It was controversial back then, and it is controversial now. And like I said before, here at Cornerstone, we do not shy away from controversy. So let me join my namesake, the Apostle Paul, in stating the controversial here this morning. Here it comes. There is only one way to the Father, and that is through the Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus' sacrifice was good once and for all. Nothing else is necessary to attain salvation. It is a free gift to everyone and anyone. All you need to do is accept it. Okay, and get ready, because here comes the really controversial part. If anyone is preaching another way, let them be eternally cursed by God. The word that Paul uses here is the word anathema. It means a person or a thing accursed or consigned to damnation or destruction. Okay, now you might be sitting back in a little bit of shock right now. Okay, the pastor is being blunt, and I don't like when they're, they're blunt. But just try to understand my position and the position of the Apostle Paul when he's writing this. Paul has a particular place in his heart for the people of Galatia. He wasn't supposed to visit them, but through God's providence, he did. He is the one who brought them to salvation in Jesus Christ, and now others have come in and led them away from it. Like a father protecting their child from a predator, Paul is being big papa bear here. Okay, like a shepherd protecting his flock from the wolves, Paul is making it abundantly clear the seriousness of the situation that we're talking about. And it is serious. We are talking about the eternal fate of everyone involved. Which is also why you sometimes see your pastors get a little animated in this matter. I'm a little animated this morning. It is not out of desire to be mean-spirited or petty, but out of a deep concern for the salvation of those placed under our charge. Put yourself in our shoes. Okay, picture yourself as a father out for a stroll with your son. You leave your son for a few seconds because you see one of your friends that you want to go talk to, and so you go talk to your friend, only to turn around and find that someone is trying to kidnap your son while your back was turned. Now, I think all the fathers in the congregation this morning would admit that they would probably make sure that that person trying to kidnap their son is not going to have a very good rest of their day if you're picking up what I'm putting down. That is the same passion that Paul has for the Galatians and that a pastor must have for their flock. They certainly should have it for their flock. So yeah, sometimes we might get a little bit worked up, but it's because we love you and we cannot ignore the seriousness of God's calling. And Paul makes it very clear here. In fact, he even repeats himself and lets it be known that even if an angel comes and preaches a different gospel, you should not believe it. Now, that could obviously apply to a certain group of people who call themselves Christians, but yet believe that an angel delivered a new gospel to the leader in the 1800s while he was living in Palmyra, New York, but we don't want to get bogged down in all that right now. But the point is clear. If anyone comes with a different gospel, no matter how subtle, no matter who they are, even if it's an angel, do not believe it. And if you are one of those people who have either believed it, or worse yet, you're one of those ones teaching it, you better get yourself on track. He continues, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. Okay, Paul addresses one other rumor here that these false teachers are saying about his gospel. Okay, they, they are accusing him of making grace cheap. 
because he, he wanted to be accepted by others. So he just made it so easy for everybody. Now, having read Paul's letters and becoming rather familiar with Paul's personality, this one almost makes me laugh. If you read Paul's letters, it is clear that the last thing Paul cares about is what other people think about him. He does not seek approval, but rather faithfully expresses what he believes God has called him to say and do. Which is why he points to the fact that if he wanted everybody to like him, then he wouldn't be serving God in the first place. He wouldn't be preaching the gospel of Jesus if he wanted everybody to like him. People not liking you kind of comes with the territory if you're faithfully serving God. Because people love the darkness. And they really don't like it when the light comes in and messes up their darkness. In fact, the real problem with the light is it shows the darkness for what it really is. Darkness. Jesus said, people are going to hate us because of him. So this accusation is pretty laughable. Okay, but Paul still feels the need to correct it, because apparently it's taken some root in the church in Galatians that, that he needs to actually talk about it. And that is just the first ten verses of Galatians. And things are already pretty spicy. Paul has foregone the usual pomp and circumstance, the usual fluff that he usually has when he writes to everybody, and jumped right into the deep end. But as we conclude here this morning, what can we take from this text? What lessons can we take with us as we go? Well, I think the first and most obvious lesson we can take is to be on guard against false teachers. Because the ones you can spot from a mile away are not the really dangerous ones. It's the ones who work their way in among us and who teach things so subtle that unless you really analyze what they're saying, you'll fall for their trap. Those of you who were in my ABF a couple Sundays ago saw that firsthand. Hey, we watched a video of a guy who was preaching something that on the surface seemed rather innocuous, maybe even true. But when we sat down and really analyzed what he was saying, it had all kinds of bad ramifications. Hey, by the way, this is just my little quick two-second ad for ABFs. You should join one. It will bless you. They happen every Sunday morning in between the services at 930. But that fellow was parroting one of the most prevalent false teachings that's out there, one that seems to be growing in popularity in the Christian church. There are several names for it. You could call it the Word of Faith Movement, the Prosperity Gospel, the Health and Wealth Gospel. There's all kinds of names for it. But the message is still the same in this other gospel, no matter what you call it. It is built on the law of attraction. Basically, what they preach is that since we are made in the image of God, then that means we also have the creative power that our Father does. So if we speak something into existence enough, if we just pray hard enough, then it will come to pass. Why is that dangerous? Why, why is that a distortion of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, it's dangerous, firstly, because while it does acknowledge Jesus dying on the cross and rising again, it states that the end goal was not eternal life for us, or forgiveness, or being conformed to the likeness of our God and our Savior. But rather, the end goal was to give to us the authority to claim things that we want for ourselves. It denies the idea that God has given us a way to live in prosperity and health and wealth right here on this side of heaven, but rather we have to do things for ourselves. We have to take things into our own hands in order to achieve that. Hey, can you see how subtle it is? It draws on the true gospel that the Apostle Paul presented to us and that this Paul is presenting to you right now and functions as a yes, but gospel. It says, yes, Jesus died on the cross, but in order to live in health and wealth, you must claim things for yourself. All the while making this blasphemous claim that we have creative power outside of God's will. That if we just pray hard enough, no matter how depraved the thing is that we're praying for, God, or sometimes they phrase it as the universe, has no choice but to give in. 
Okay? And I know some of us, I don't know if some of us here, but I, I have known people who have fallen for this gospel, okay? And it's very subtle, okay? They'll give you little oil, vials of oil that have specific purposes for them. So they'll say, this is, this is the wealth oil. So here, take this and sprinkle it on your computer. And so whenever you do a financial transaction on your computer, God will bless it. Okay? Need to stay away from it. That is an example of a false gospel, a gospel that I would call a yes, but gospel. Okay? But there are also yes, and gospels, just like the one that Paul was dealing with with the Galatians. Now, how do those present themselves? Well, they present themselves very often just like the Judaizers presented their gospel. They'll say, yes, Jesus died and rose, and you need to believe in him. That's great. And you must also do these other things or else you aren't really saved. Now, there are a ton of these out there. And some of them are very prominent. And since I said we don't shy away from controversy, let's continue that trend. Here we go. The Mormon church is a yes and gospel. Okay. Now, there are problems besides the yes and gospel part that, you know, with what the Mormons actually, who, who they believe Jesus is, okay? They believe in a different Jesus than we do, okay? But even if they did believe in a Jesus that we do, it's still a yes and gospel, okay? At its core, the Mormon church teaches that its members are saved by faith in Jesus. Sounds good so far, right? Okay? But it teaches that they're saved by faith in Jesus after all they've done. Let me phrase it differently to make it easier to understand. It teaches that, the, that only once a member of the Mormon church has purified themselves from all unrighteousness. Read that, sin. Only after they've purified themselves of all of that, then can the grace of Jesus actually apply to them. That's a yes and gospel. Let's get even more controversial, shall we? I think a strong argument can be made that the Catholic Church is a yes and gospel. In fact, this book, the book of Galatians, was one of the main driving forces behind the Protestant Reformation. Catholics believe that unless they have performed certain acts, certain sacraments, then the grace of Jesus will not be sufficient to grant them eternal life in heaven. That's a yes and gospel. I told you they were prevalent. And there are countless other false gospels out there, okay? We could talk about the universalist gospel that believes that no matter what an individual's position is on Jesus Christ, everyone will eventually be saved because God is just too nice to condemn anybody. And we could go on, but we don't have all day. The point is, these other gospels are subtle. They have all the pieces there. They just have a few of them out of place, or they have a few extra ones. They are a distortion of the true gospel. In fact, these other gospels are so subtle that if you ask those who believe in them, like a Mormon or a Catholic, for, uh, they'll tell you that they believe what you believe. That they don't believe in another gospel. But they actually believe in the one true one. And in fact, if you express the gospel that you believe in, they'll go, yeah, I believe that. And then you go, but wait a minute, don't you also believe this? And they go, well, yeah. You believe in another gospel. So we must be ever on guard against these false teachings and make sure that we do not fall into them. Okay, lesson number one. Second lesson for today. Go easy on your pastors. When they get worked up about these things, go easy on them. You may not understand why it's such a big deal, but try and see it through their eyes. What they see is their own child, their own flock being led away to slaughter. And sometimes out of passion, they feel for their flock and they speak with passion and fervor, maybe more than you would usually care for. But they're reacting that way because they recognize that this is a life and death scenario. They are being what some of us would call mean, not out of spite, but out of love for those involved to make it clear how serious the situation is. Give them a break. 
Third lesson. What I think we all need to do here this morning and as we leave this place is ask ourselves, why are we obeying God's word? Yeah, it sounds weird. Let me just start by saying, I hope that you are actively seeking to know and obey God's word. You should be reading your Bible every day so that you know it and so you can obey it. But when you seek to obey God's word, why are you doing it? Are you doing it out of acknowledgement for what Christ has already done for you and out of peace from the knowledge that if you accept that free gift that he's offering you and identify yourself in Christ, then you are already clothed in his righteousness and approved by God? Or are you doing it because you are seeking God's approval through your actions? Are you doing it not out of peace, but actually out of insecurity, trying to justify yourself by your own righteous deeds? Do you know the grace and peace that Paul is talking about here? And final thing that I want us to think about here this morning. Does everybody like you? Now, I know that sounds kind of weird, okay? But seriously, does everyone like you? Okay. Jesus told us that people would hate us because of him. Now, that does not mean that we should be actively trying to offend people or that we now have a license to be jerks. Okay. And trust me, there are Christians out there who think that they do have that license. Okay? Okay, but it doesn't mean that. What it does mean, if everyone likes you, is that you might not be living your faith loud enough. If you're telling the truth, someone is bound to get offended by the truth. And if no one's offended by you, or rather I should say, if no one's offended by the truth of God that you present, then maybe you need to be, uh, you need a little bit of self-reflection in that area of your life. Okay. Are you seeking to please men, or are you seeking to please God? And now, as we conclude here, as we go out into the world with the lessons that we've learned here this morning, I pray that everyone within the sound of my voice, everyone here and everyone out there on the internet, I pray that you know the grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us all from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever, ever. Amen.